Hi, thank you for sticking all the way through PyCon. You guys are awesome. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me at PyCon. Thank you for having me in your country. I'm so far away from home. I'm kind of delirious right now. Bear with me, it's gonna be a crazy one. My name is Rich Jones. I'm the founder of Gun.io. Uh, we provide awesome freelance gigs for free and open source hackers. I am also the author of Shameless Pug Alert, Zappa, Python serverless framework, and a whole bunch of other packages uh, that you may have encountered in your open source travels. Welcome to Serverless, Lambda, and Beyond, a talk in three parts. Warning, this talk is going to move fast. I think that it's better to be overwhelmed than to be bored during a talk. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Don't, you don't need to hold your questions until the end. If you are confused by anything, just start shouting at me, that's fine. You might wanna know, what does serverless mean? It's a, the, it's a buzzword, everybody's saying it. What the hell does that mean? Um, part one, going serverless with Zappa. Uh, serverless, uh, for all intents and purposes, for the first part of this talk will mean no permanent infrastructure with a little asterisk next to it that we will get to later. Uh, it means using Amazon Web Services Lambda and Amazon Web Services API Gateway. Uh, there still are servers before somebody chimes in and gets really technical on me. The important thing is that they are ephemer ephemeral, meaning that they do not last for very long at all. Uh, it is in the milliseconds range. So with a traditional web server that you are all used to uh, in the good old days, you have a web server like Apache or Nginx that sits there listening for requests as they come in. Uh, then you will have an application like Mod Whiskey, which was written by Graham. Is, is he back there? Yeah. Uh, we have a legend in the house, uh, which will, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think it will turn it into a whiskey environment, uh, send it to the whiskey server like Gunicorn. Uh, Django will then process the request at your application layer, whatever fun stuff you've had your, your web application uh, set up to do. The web server then returns that to the, to the client and the web server goes back to listening for new incoming requests. The problem with that is if you have a sudden spike of web traffic coming in, then the incoming requests uh, form a queue and the ones that come in at the back of the queue might take too long to be processed and for the client on the other end of the internet, it looks like your website is down because they don't receive a uh, uh, response from your web server in time. So uh, the model instead when using Zappa is that the request comes in to Amazon's API gateway. Uh, the, that API request is then ma mapped into a, a dictionary object using a language for printers called VTL that comes from the 1970s that I had to learn to, to make this stupid thing work. Uh, the server is then created at that point um, the server then receives that dictionary, converts it into a whiskey request and feeds that whiskey into Django. Uh, your Django does its magic and then returns through the API gateway, at which point the server is destroyed and the API gateway returns the response to the client. Um, because this happens on a per request basis, you don't have that queuing problem. So you never have to worry about traffic overloading your web servers. Um, the whole process takes about 30 milliseconds, which is uh, pretty acceptable for an API request. And by the time the user has rendered the page in their browser, the server no longer exists. It has disappeared, which is a pretty zen kind of, uh, kind of thing. I like that. Uh, this has a bunch of advantages over traditional web servers. Uh, the primary one out of the gate is that it's super scalable. So because one request maps to one server, 10 requests map to 10 servers, 100 requests, and it just, you can just keep adding zeros and it just goes all the way up. You never have to worry about scalability again. Uh, for most applications, it's gonna be orders of magnitude less expensive if you're on a low to medium traffic uh, site because you pay by the millisecond. So in US dollars, it's 0 0.00000002 cents per millisecond. I converted that into SGDs for you. Uh, it's, it's actually quite similar, it's been nice. Uh, 
Uh, and Amazon will give you three million seconds free. So for the vast majority of common use cases, that ends up being free hosting. So before, I actually was running four uh, Linode boxes. They were just like traditional VPSs that were costing me uh, $20 a month each. So I was spending like $1,000 a year on hosting. And then I swapped out all the apps that they were running to Zappa. And it saved me like 1000 bucks a year, which was cool. Um, you don't ever have to worry about maintenance because there's no servers to maintain. They don't exist. So you don't have to worry about like updates and kernel patching and all that fun stuff. No downtime, no load balancing, no security patches, no downtime, and you can fire your entire ops team, which is great. Cool. What else can it do? You can build event driven architectures, which are super fun. So you can have code execute in response to things that happen elsewhere in your ecosystem such as file uploads and incoming email events and new users appearing in your database. But you're so greedy and you want more features, I gave them to you. We give you rollbacks. We give you free SSL certificates with Let's Encrypt. We give you log management and tailing. Uh, I, I added this thing called Keep Warm so that there's always a, a warm application in Amazon's like memory just waiting for you so you avoid what's called the cold start problem where the first request after a long period of time takes a lot longer than the subsequent ones. Um, I've, all, I've compiled what well, me and the, and the wonderful members of the Zappa community have contributed many uh, popular uh, Python libraries that have C extensions in them, like some of the uh, scientific and mathematical libraries have been pre-compiled uh, into uh, Lambda compatible versions for you that get automatically installed when you deploy. So some of your favorite ones here, OpenCV, NumPy, crypto stuff, and like hundreds of others. Uh, you can load remote environment variables from S3, which is very handy for production stuff. It integrates really nicely with uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery systems. You can directly invoke remote commands by using the invoke uh, command and just like point it at any function inside of your application and instantly run it in the cloud. Um, you can even just use like raw Python and execute that directly. It has management commands for if you guys are Django users, uh, all your Django management commands will, will work out of the box as well. You don't need to modify your existing applications in any way because it speaks normal whiskey um, that all Python web services do. There's no vendor lock-in. It's battle tested. It's used by banks, governments, medical companies, and uh, you know, whole bunch of other people. It works with any whiskey application, works with Django, uh, works with Flask, works with Pyramid, Bottle, Hug is a cool one if you haven't used that. This guy used it, took him five minutes, saved a bunch of money. I uh, didn't even have to do anything. I've gotten emails from people who told me that they've saved literally millions of dollars by doing this. Uh, okay, you wanna get started now, I've convinced you. Good luck, it's, it's super easy. You pip install it, you do Zappa init, it's gonna hold your hand, you're gonna answer some questions, and you're just gonna basically say yes, yes, yes. It's gonna spit out a configuration file for you. You're gonna type deploy. It's going to do all this stuff for you that you would normally have to sit in the AWS console for a long time checking a bunch of boxes or reading documentation. I did it so you don't have to. And then it's done. You now have an infinitely scalable website in like two seconds. Bam, you're serverless. Uh, there is an elephant in the room. That elephant is the database. Uh, this is where it starts to get slightly trickier. Um, yeah. Uh, so I would, I would ask you, do you actually need a database? Um, you, I want you to try to start thinking serverlessly, uh, which means avoiding permanent infrastructure basically at all costs. Um, so something that I've done to help you with this is created another package called NoDB, which uh, replaces your traditional uh, Postgres or MySQL hosted database with something based on S3. Um, you install it with pip uh, and you basically use it as you would any other kind of simple uh, document object store. What do we do here? Yeah, we point it at our bucket, give it an index and just load and save objects uh, as, as we want and then they'll appear and we can use them in any of our serverless applications. Uh, 
as, as trying to like load test this, I wrote uh, a BitTorrent tracker that's based on NoDB and it's able to scale to basically the same size as the whole Pirate Bay, um, but without any permanent infrastructure at all. So uh, because Amazon does most of the heavy lifting for us, we can build like really, really scalable uh, applications uh, without any permanent infrastructure to maintain at all on like uh, basically for pennies. Um, and yeah, we can build event-driven architectures, which I find super fun, um, which means we execute our code in response to AWS ecosystem events. We don't have to worry about blocking pages. We don't have to do celery. Part of why I made this is because of how much I hate celery. celery. Sorry if anybody who wrote celery is here, but celery is a, is a nightmare. I hate it. Um, and we never have to use it again. So let me show you an example of something easy and quick that you can do. So if you've ever managed a website with users, you've probably had to deal with avatars, um, which means accepting arbitrary file uploads from users and then having a queuing system so that you can shrink them and find a nice place. And uh, what should be like a fairly simple thing ends up being kind of a pain in the butt. Um, but with Zappa, uh, we can make it a lot easier by using this pattern where uh, the user uses HTTP to upload their image directly into S3. When that image lands in the S3 bucket, the Lambda function automatically fires off. It does the thumbnail resizing and it puts it back into your S3 location. So this is a really simple example. Basically like uh, we've written a function that uh, executes in response to, S to the S3 event. We grab the, the name of it and the key, we downloaded it to a temporary directory, we do our thumbnailing and we put it back in S3. Uh, uh, and then uh, Zappa will create this uh, config for you that defines when it should execute. So you've got your S3 bucket and just say whenever an object is created in that bucket, you should execute this function right here. Uh, you type Zappa schedule um, and that's it, you're done. You don't have to build any queues, you don't have to build uh, any additional infrastructure at all. Uh, it'll just execute in response to that event. Pro tip here is to make sure that you don't get stuck in an infinite loop by putting the same thumbnail back into that bucket and so you don't continue to thumbnail a thumbnail. And you can do that by uh, having a more specific path in your uh, S3 event uh, URL. Um, another example that you can do is, is notifications. So uh, time is also an event source in the same way that uh, emails and object uploads are. So uh, here's an example where, that we use a lot is where you can send daily notifications to your company's Slack channel. Um, so uh, if, you, if you came to the talk about building Slack bots yesterday, you already have some awesome Slack bots that you made last night, and uh, now you can hook them up uh, to time events and have them fire off whenever uh, new users appear. Uh, we use basically a similar syntax to the configuration that we saw before, but we use, uh, rather than the S3 event, we use uh, our, our rate expression. You can use rate or cron syntax, and then again, type Zappa schedule, and the lead bot will send a notification to your Slack about what happened in the past 24 hours. Um, hooray, super simple. Robots are taking over, great. Um, but what if you don't want to wait for an event? You can use Zappa to execute functions asynchronously in a different Lambda, which is very handy sometimes. If you want to bake a, t bake a cake, let's bake a cake. Cake. Uh, this is our, this is basically, I'm not very good at cake baking. This is what I assume goes into baking a cake, where you gather the ingredients and you bake a cake and then you give your cake to whoever wants the cake. Uh, this is what's called pseudocode, I think. Um, uh, so you can use Zappa as a library as well. So from Zappa asynchronous, we can import this task decorator and we wrap our function uh, in task. We just put task right above it. And then imagine we have an API endpoint where people order their cakes. Uh, because we wrapped ta uh, big cake in a decorator, uh, this function will execute in an entirely different Lambda. So you, we can respond immediately uh, you'll get a token back as well if you want to deliver, you know, tell them where they're, where they're, if they want to check on their cake's status. But then because our baked cake function includes delivery as well, 
you know, we have this completely asynchronous scalable pipeline that required no configuration and no uh, permanent infrastructure to set up. Um, it's that easy. No config, no queues, no salary. Uh, go nuts. It's awesome. We can build all, make all the cakes we want. But what if you want to bake mission critical cakes for the entire planet at the same time? Uh, then we're going to start looking into a more advanced technique called globally available serverless architectures. Because uh, if your servers are nowhere, then they can be everywhere at the same time. Uh, so one of the benefits of global deployments is redundancy. Um, cloud computing sounds magical. What it really means is it's somebody else's servers in a basement in Virginia. Um, Amazon also goes down because they're just servers in a basement. Uh, you're just paying somebody else to run them for you. Um, AWS has outages on a regular basis. It's not too often, but uh, if there are any big AWS users, uh, you've probably felt this. Uh, Amazon goes down too, but usually it'll happen in a specific region at a specific time. I don't think there's been too many instances of all of Amazon going down at the same time across the planet at once. So if you have your application deployed to multiple regions at the same time, then you can have a failover set up so that uh, your application will just switch to the nearest region. Uh, pro tip. Don't host your status page on your own infrastructure like Amazon does, because <laughs> what Amazon included this little handy icon. Unfortunately, it's, the, it's hosted on its S3, and it's the status icon for S3. So it looks like everything's fine, because it can't load the everything's broken <laughs> logo. Don't do that, fail. Um, two, it's faster. Um, so from where I was to location in Ohio took uh, 40 milliseconds round trip to ping my app, but then I deployed it to Tokyo and it took 200 seconds. Uh, and that's just for ping alone, just because it's, we're limited by the speed of light. The earth is big, as I can attest, I've seen it. Um, please provide non-US and US users equal, with equally great service by deploying the same application to the nearest data center to uh, your users and they will be happy. Um, scalability is another advantage. More regions, more concurrent executions out of the box. You don't have to talk to Amazon as often to get your training wheels lifted. You can handle trillions of events a year by doing this. Trillion with a T, which is really fun. It's more secure because you can compartmentalize the, your data, limit the amount of damage and exposure that is happening. Um, you can defend against different threats inside of your organization. Um, you can prevent, this is something if you work in regulated environments, I, I work in medical environments a lot, you could, you're required to prevent non-US you know, uh, non employees from accessing US uh, uh, client data and stuff like that. That probably happens for, <laughs> Uh, European clients a lot as well as imagine. This is a really big topic that I'm blasting through. I'm not saying that doing this makes you more secure. I'm saying that it can make you more secure. Consult your local hacker for more details. Uh, similar to the, to the security advantages are the regulatory compliance advantages. So different countries have different laws, uh, particularly around medical data and financial data and PII and private communications and data retention. Uh, especially, again, if you're working in Europe or American regulated industries, these are huge issues that come up. Um, I'm not your lawyer. You don't want me as your lawyer, but ask your lawyer. Um, but basically, a single product deployed internationally may have different compliance needs, um, and uh, globally available deployments will help you uh, spread that out and reduce your liability there. Okay, I'm convinced. How do we do it? So during that init process, when uh, the Zappa walkthrough was kind of holding your hand, one of the questions that it asked you is, do you want to make this a global application? And you hit yes, so your uh, config file is now gigantic because it has all the regions in it. And when you hit deploy, you typed tac tac all, and then you certified all those, all those regions as well. And that's it. Your application now exists in like 20 different regions all around the globe, and they will all get the best uh, service that you can provide them. It's pretty sweet. 
Uh, since we're at PyCon Singapore, and you guys are all crazy good with data and machine learning stuff, I'd like to talk a little bit about Elastic uh, Big Data Processing, which is another area where serverless technologies kind of shine. Uh, this is uh, a trick, a pattern, uh, that is particularly useful if you are a data scientist and you don't want to keep having to spin up uh, expensive infrastructure or you're waiting for time available on your high performance computing cluster or something like that or if you uh, do a lot of data processing as part of a production system so uh, as we saw in one of the talks in the uh, first keynote I think it was that a lot of the big challenges of AI ML right now are not the scientists who are doing the modeling but the people who are actually taking the models and putting them in production systems uh, and making them work in uh, performant, reasonable ways. Um, the trick is to, is to fan out, as it's called, the fan out pattern, where we start with a single lambda, we from that lambda scale up to however many tens of thousands of lambda simultaneously that we need, and then fall back into a single lambda or have those little, uh, those many lambdas do their own reporting uh, to your final endpoints. Um, you get a uh, rapid elastic parallel computing without uh, a physical supercomputer required. Some really quick examples. The first one for parallel data processing. Uh, suppose you have a large genetic data set and you want to process it on a sample wise basis. Uh, first, grab your data set from a refine.bio. This is a shameless plug for uh, a product that I worked on recently where we got all of the transcriptomic data in the world and we labeled it for you so that you can build uh, uh, genetic experiments without having to, to uh, uh, go out and get it yourself. So if you want to build a neuro, uh, medulloblastoma data set, you type in medulloblastoma, you download your labeled CSV data. Um, here we can take a look. Uh, once again, we're using the task decorator that we saw before. We're loading our samples out, outside of our uh, our function definitions, as we saw in the Lambda talk yesterday, for a performance advantage. Uh, we're having our classifier be our task, and we're, uh, we have another uh, function for processing all of our samples inside of that classifier. Uh, we deploy this with Zappa Deploy, and then we invoke it with uh, just the raw invocation command, and that's it. Now we can have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of samples individually processed. It'll go from that one, it'll blast out to, uh, um, to execute all of the samples in parallel. Um, I use this trick a fair amount at work while I was building Refine Bio because the pipelines would take hours to run on my laptop, but could be run, uh, you know, in basically seconds using Zappa. Um, the code also still works locally if you don't have access to web systems. Um, because task is smart like that. You can also use this to mix local and remote code execution. So um, this is, I can run this, this is basically the same code that we saw earlier, but I could execute this on my local laptop, but because I've defined where the remote lambdas live and what region I want to execute them on, uh, the, the executions when they're called inside my local code will actually happen on remote infrastructure but will operate as if they were local. Um, the second example is for using machine learning in production. Let's suppose you have a whole lot of predictors and you want to choose the one with the highest confidence. Um, maybe each of your predictors can operate in less than the span of a single request but they can't all. This is a, uh, a lot of our users have ended up using this pattern. Uh, so what we can do is Imagine that we have all of our predictor functions uh, that we want to figure out which is the best recommendation, for instance. Uh, we have a bunch of different models for recommendations. We're going to get the request in from the user. We'll, we'll send it out uh, simultaneously to all of our predictor functions. Uh, we'll wait until those functions all uh, get back to us. It's happening simultaneously. We'll choose the one that uh, returns its own highest self-confidence, and then we'll give that result to the user. Um, and that'll all happen in the span of a single request. So, you know, less than 100 milliseconds, if possible. Uh, yeah, so one request branches out to lots of uh, predictions. We choose the best one, and we return it back to the user. Um, that's a pattern that gets used a lot. Um, hooray. Hooray. But, 
My goal as a, as a hacker is to promote user freedom. I really just wanted, I really hate ops, I really hate salary, I really just wanted a super and easy way to host scalable web services. But unfortunately, I've now convinced through, through this app, uh, this package, I've convinced thousands of people to use Amazon, which sucks. Part two, why you shouldn't use Zappa now that I've convinced you to use it. Uh, Amazon this year has been very hostile towards our community. Uh, they have gone, as you know, the, the, many of the popular tech media have commented on, they have gone from neutral platform to cutthroat competitor, say open source developers. Uh, they're basically ripping us off. They're ripping off all the work that the free and open source community are doing. They're not contributing back. Um, and because of their hostility towards our community th this year, we've lost MongoDB, we've lost Redis, we've lost Elasticsearch to new proprietary licenses. I don't blame them for what they've for for relicensing. I think it's I think it's an interesting move that they've made, but it's not good. It's not good for our community that uh, these you know necessary open source projects are closing up and having proprietary forks. Uh, you know, and openly in response to Amazon's aggressive behavior. Um, they also did it to me. They made a version of Zappa that is uh, worse. It's, it's, and they didn't give me any credit. They've never reached out. They've never supported me in any way. They didn't even give me a link back um, for their clone project. And it just, it feels a lot like the late 1990s uh, Microsoft days of Embrace, Extends, and Extinguish all over again. Uh, and that's just their web division. Uh, they don't pay taxes. This is their profits. They made twelve, bil what, ten billion dollars last year, and made uh, and paid negative taxes. They were subsidized by the U.S. government. Uh, they basically, they're, America is full of ghost towns right now because Amazon has destroyed local mom and pop businesses. They don't pay medical out. So this is what Jeff Bezos makes in two to six hours in a single day would have paid for 2,000 people's medical benefits and he slashed it anyway. They overwork and underpay their employees. There's all these horror stories of Amazon workers not even being allowed to go to the bathroom on their 12 hour shifts in these horrible factories. All the further enriched, the guy who's already the richest man in the world. I don't want to give him my money anymore. He's basically a Bond villain. Look at this. He's the richest man in the world in a giant mech suit. He's not a good guy. We should not support him anymore. Screw Amazon. I hope they're not a sponsor. I'm sorry if you guys are a sponsor. You've been very, the food was great. Hotel is nice. Um, let's build our own Lambda. Let's build our own replacement. We're going to use something, a new project called OpenFast. Um, you know, yeah. I got a yay. Uh, so you might remember this acronym from the olden days, LAMP, which was Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Python all together. We're not talking about LAMP anymore. Now we're talking about PLONK. Yeah, great acronym. That's really going to take off. In two years, you guys are all, there's, you're going to be at the PLONK conf. You know, this is, this is a thing. This is going on. Uh, PLONK stands for Prometheus, Linkerd, OpenFast, Nats, and Kubernetes. Um, we don't need to worry too much about uh, uh, the other ones. We're mostly going to focus today on OpenFast and Kubernetes. Um, this is what everything does individually. Uh, we got Prometheus, which handles kind of like dashboards. Linkerd, which handles uh, queuing stuff. OpenFast, which is going to be um, the replacement for Lambda. Nats, which does the um, the networking and the message busing, and then Kubernetes, which handles the um, the where to place the containers inside of the network and uh, handles the auto scaling. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can you can run it. Uh, you can fortunately you can run Kubernetes anywhere. You can run Kubernetes on Amazon, but you can take your same Kubernetes deployment and when Amazon uh, you know steals your project idea and doesn't give you credit for them and you don't like them anymore, you can move to Google or you can move to, I would suggest running your own colo. Uh, it's fun. You know, you actually do end up saving money if, you, if you're willing to do the work yourself. Um, but combined, all of this, this Plonk stack gives us everything that we need to build an alternative to AWS Lambda and API Gateway. And we can run it on any cloud host or you can run it on your hardware 
Or what's interesting is you can use lots of clouds at the same time. You can run your own hardware and have a cloud, and you can have the same production system uh, you know, span both of those. OK, so let's try it out. Um, it's as easy as that, which is <laughs> welcome to Kubernetes. This is going to be fun. Um, OK, that's not super easy. But once you do all of that, you type in fast. And now you have a tool on your local computer that will help you manage your open fast functions. Notice that they also chose to put their l logo in a figlet font when you call the. Uh, I think I'm going to take credit for starting that fashion trend, but that's fine. Um, and then you call your cube control function, and you'll see that you're running all that stuff that we talked about. Oh, you can't really see that too well, but all that stuff in the plunk acronym that we talked about earlier is now running. And if you go to um, uh, you know, your local host, you'll see that you have a new dashboard for OpenFast. Um, you can, uh, from the command line, we can make a new function. So we're going to type fast, uh, new. We're going to choose Python 3 as our language. I'm calling it echo upper because it's going to be an echo server that will uppercase anything that we send to it. I prefixed it with my name because it's bad user interface and you just have to do that. Um, this will give us a new config file that's pretty pr fairly self-explanatory here about what that's going to do. Um, we're going to have a single handler. It's a, the, basically the most simple uh, open fast function that we could make. Like I said, it's going to be an echo server that will uppercase. So we're going to take the request in, we're going to set it to uppercase, and we're going to return it. Uh, we're going to deploy it with fast up. And then we can, you know, we can check it out. So we echo high to it. We uh, invoke it. We can see that our high is uppercase. We can also use curl to go through the, uh, the web interface to it. Um, sweet. We built an extremely complicated, highly scalable echo function, which is not useful at all. Um, but we can get a lot more functionality from the OpenFast function store, um, which is a growing collection of useful, community contributed free and open source microservices for your application. Um, so if, if you click on the button that we saw on that dashboard, you get uh, access to all of the things that the community has contributed so far. So right here we see like a face detection, have I been owned, curl, some SSL utilities. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new ecosystem that's growing really quickly. Um, and basically, we're building kind of like Lego for machine learning applications, where you'll be able to use these individual functions um, and build complex applications uh, with them without having to know too much of like building the individual containers that will execute these little ML uh, uh, functions, um, which is actually quite useful. Uh, new project alert. You're the first people to, uh, to ever see this. Um, I've started a new project called Fashion. I'm hoping to do. Uh, for OpenFast, what Zappa did for um, AWS Lambda. It's easy and awesome Pythonic OpenFast. Um, you can check it out. It's on my GitHub uh, now. Um, the cool thing about it is that it allows us to use OpenFast functions as if they were native code blocks. Um, but they actually run inside of their own containers in our Kubernetes cluster. So. Um, Here's the, like a, a trivial example that we can do. So this is a Python application with Fashion. We import from Fashion. We can import anything, um, but because we have Figlet already installed in our OpenFast cluster, we can just import Figlet and then execute this as if it were just you know, another function that we have in our local Python application. But this is actually running inside of its own container in a Docker container inside of our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we don't have to do any function definition um, because of something that just landed in Python 3.7 called PEP562, which is neat. Thank you, whoever was in charge of that one. I found it very useful for writing this. Um, obviously, we can chain these functions together. So, you know, if I have a left pad function and a figlet function, then I can make a, a left padded figlet. And again, both of these are executing inside of independent Docker containers somewhere in our cluster. Um, we can do this asynchronously. Um, we can chain these asynchronous calls together to build uh, ETL pipelines, which is going to be very useful. And we can limit functions to certain instance types. So this is my favorite uh, part of what Fashion can do so far. 
Um, because this is a problem that, again, if you're doing AI ML in production systems that you've probably encountered where you, you have some expensive function that you need to do on expensive hardware, but you don't, you want to minimize the use of that expensive hardware and have the cheap, uh, easy things done on the cheap hardware. Um, so in our function definitions, uh, we can s add a single line. This is a constraint. So to our, we have a, a f uh, open fast function called update model, and we're going to put this constraint on it that it, it only runs on GPU instance types. And then from our application layer, we just import them as if they're normal functions, uh, but update model will only ever run on GPU instances inside of our cluster, and the send result email, which can be run on any commodity hardware, uh, will run on the cheapest CPU instances available. And then, but we don't need to know that as application developers. Um, we can just write this as if this were any other normal program, but it will automatically handle where to place um, the expensive functions on the ex you know, uh, expensive hardware and the cheap functions on the cheap hardware. So Plonk will handle the placement and the elasticity required for spinning up the expensive hardware, scaling it back down, and, and putting the right functions in the right place. Um, so essentially, this is automatic cost optimization that happens at the application layer, which is pretty magic. Um, is this useful? I don't know. You, tell, you try it out. Uh, I have no idea. I hope this is useful. I think it, c it could be, potentially. Um, OpenFast is a very young project, but it has a really good team behind it. They're, they're very, he's a strict, uh, uh, he's a strict uh, dictator, which is a good thing for, for a successful open source project, I think. So I really wish them luck. I think this has potential to um, unseat some of Amazon's uh, dominance over the function as a service industry right now. Uh, so, okay, what have we done? Now we can use serverless patterns on our own hardware or more ethical web hosts than AWS. We are serverless, but we still have a lot of servers and a lot of tooling and a lot of voodoo required to do it. My goal at the offset was to destroy ops, and now I have a way more ops to do, which is not what I wanted at all. So Plonk is a good solution if you are able to handle the complexity and you're already c committed to Kubernetes and you can afford the ops burden. Um, Kubernetes is great for consultant, lousy for lazy hackers like me. Um, fortunately, there are off-the-shelf Kubernetes vendors. Uh, Amazon is one of them, as was mentioned before, and we're starting to see the emergence of dedicated open fast hosts. So you actually won't even have to manage your own cluster. You'll just be able to deploy these functions um, and they'll handle all the, the clustering stuff for you. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of activity happening in the next 12 to 18 months, I think. But I'm just a regular guy. I don't want to run a ser I want to run my services and I never wanna worry about servers. Okay, finally, we're gonna go actually servers, as in literally no servers. We're finally doing it. You guys have been, the, been bugging me for years. The, the, Zappa actually isn't servers, that there are servers. We are going to have no servers. Part three, let's build a new internet. Enter the peer-to-peer -peer web. Um, so right now we have centralized. I'm interested in decentralization towards full distribution. Um, there is an exciting landscape of new peer-to-peer -peer technologies and protocols that are emerging to enable completely new types of web services. Um, Solid, Nextcloud, ZeroNet, Gun, IPFS, DAT, Scuttlebutt, Data Shards, WebTorrent, and a whole host of other ones. Uh, the movement itself is called uh, re-decentralization. Um, this is what Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, is currently working on himself. Uh, some of the advantages are less centralized corporate control. Uh, this is a big problem that's happening in America. Uh, where there's a small handful of extremely powerful tech companies who have increasing control over uh, people's lives, and we're not happy about it. Uh, it also means better global distribution and inter uh, interconnectivity in general. So there's a billion people in Africa, and there's no AWS web uh, services there. You know, like, it's, it's, we're still unevenly distributed in what people have access to what servers. So if we can turn all of those people who have phones and internet connections but no access to 
uh, data, data centers, if we can turn them into nodes that are participating in the computational graph, then they will have you know, better connectivity with us and that will be a huge benefit. Um, the model of privacy is different. There's much better network resilience. It's censorship resistant. It allows for more creative expression uh, and generally more freedom for users. And most importantly for me, I don't have to run any servers. I hate running servers. So uh, I'm very excited about this. The, the, the model is pretty simple. You publish a service, you seed it, users will come to your cool website and check out your service, but as they are accessing it, they become peers in the network themselves and they start to distribute your service from their clients. And eventually, once there's enough uh, you know, the website is popular and healthy enough, you don't have to continue to seed it anymore because the network itself is, is large enough. So your website persists even after the servers have gone away. Um, that sounds cool, but it's impossible. No, we can do it right now. And we're gonna do it with a technology called DAT. DAT is cool. DAT is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol um, developed by some uh, bearded dudes who live in Oakland. Um, it is a community-driven project for distributed data synchronization. Uh, you can basically think of it as Git plus BitTorrent plus HTTP plus magic uh, all at the same time. Um, it's not really designed for this. It's designed for data scientists like you to be able to share large mutable data sets um, between themselves because if you've ever tried to, to put uh, large genetic database uh, data sets inside of Git, Git is really bad for handling uh, data. DAT is really good for handling data. Um, but it also works with dynamic web content, uh, which gives us this wonderful opportunity to build completely new kinds of services. Uh, just some terminology for while we continue this. Uh, DAT's going to be the replacement for HTTP as we know it. DAT CLI is kind of a replacement for curl. Beaker is uh, one of the browsers that's emerging for, for, for the DAT layer, which you can think of as a yeah, replacement for Chrome or Firefox. And then Hashbase is kind of like where a lot of this activity is occurring. So it's kind of like a replacement for GitHub. Let's publish a DAT site. Um, Currently, the ecosystem is entirely in JavaScript. I think that's something that we as a Python community can improve. It will be better for uh, the peer-to-peer -peer web if uh, there are more than uh, one client implementation. So I think it would be great if there were a, a Python implementation of DAT. But it's very simple. You know, we go to our website, we type DAT, and then, oh, you can't really read that, but it's given us a DAT URL, and then I can share that with any DAT user anywhere in the world, and they can uh, open it up in, in Beaker or DAT CLI and they can go check it out and then they're serving it. So we can take our server down and the, the web service will continue to persist um, from their client. It's super duper easy. The users download the site from each other so we don't have to worry about servers anymore. Um, DATs are also in the same way that the web is hypertext, DAT, DATs are hyper available and they can be, they're mutable as well. So we can build dynamic web content uh, that's peer-to-peer -peer distributed. Um, the coolest application of this that I've seen so far is a DAT site called Ducks Tape. So people are able to create mixtapes. Um, they host their music and they can share it with uh, their friends. And, and then uh, there's this whole community of kind of, of, of tape traders that are able to, to share their music with each other on without any centralized servers at all. I think that this could be the beginning of a new decentralized web. I'm very excited about this kind of stuff. Um, it's also really fun. Uh, I don't know if you, you guys are, you look pretty young, but if you remember like what the old web was like when it was like kooky and fun, it kind of feels like, like we could have a little bit uh, of that back again before it was just like big corporate websites and people yelling at each other when it was just like creative and weird. Pardon? <coughs> Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's. I'm. I let's. Let's do it. Let's bring like the the late '90s back. Um, this, this is my website. Uh, it's the Rich Zone. It had flames and an animated GIF background and cool cheat codes for the N64 and my favorite hacking tools that would kick you, kick my fr my friends and rivals off of AOL. Um, 
<laughs> um, but I seriously believe that we can replace Google, Twitter, Facebook, Nextbook, Uber, Slack, Spotify, SoundCloud, all of the, the, the big names in the web. I think that they can be taken out. And not only can we, I think we should, and I think that we must take them out. And we should replace them with free and open source versions of these applications that don't spy on us. Uh, I basically want to live in a post-advertising world. I hate advertising. I think that we can do, uh, do without it. And I think that we should build community initiatives to replace all of those major uh, tech giants. Uh, to anybody who thinks that because the way the world is now that powerful services can't be entrenched, uh, ask that. Does anybody know who that guy is? <laughs> uh, that's Tom from MySpace. If you get that joke, you are officially old. Fortunately, nobody here is, is old enough to remember that besides me, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, the history is littered. It's a giant graveyard of these gigantic corporations like Dogpile, MySpace, Yahoo, AOL, Snapchat, Dig, SourceForge, and, and thousands of others who, who came and went. You know, And I think um, that basically all of the tech incumbents can be dethroned. Uh, <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> um, I think the, the opportunities to do this are too large and too exciting to ignore. Uh, even better, we can build new types of collaborative services that we couldn't really imagine before. So I want to see a thousand projects like Wikipedia. You know, I feel like we, there was a brief moment where we started building these collaborative initiatives like Wikipedia and Linux and OpenStreetMaps, and we've kind of lost the momentum behind that, and I think we can get it back. I want to see libraries for everybody in the world. I think rather than dismantling the oppressive systems, that we should just focus our efforts on building liberated alternatives that make the old systems obsolete. Um, this has been our story so far. This is why we have Linux. This is why we have web browsers. This is why we have Python. This is why we have our community today. Um, we shouldn't abandon this part of our history. I think we should also make it into part of our future as well. Um, there's so much to be done if you guys want to participate. Uh, there's a lot of new opportunities. There's a lot of challenges that are going to come, or come up with this. I think challenges are fun because you get to solve new problems that have never been solved before. Um, so please, next time you start a project, consider opportunities to re-decentralize. OK, in conclusion, save time and money. Build awesome event-driven applications. Never have downtime. Be fast everywhere. Use Zappa. Your favorite companies already are. Or if you don't want to give any more money to Jeff Bezos, who is literally an evil Bond villain, use Plunk and Fashion to run efficient data processing pipelines with your own fast platform. Uh, but you'll have to learn Kubernetes, which you can do at the workshop tomorrow with my man Graham back there. Um, and finally, if you want to be part of the next generation of web technologies and services, join me in re-decentralizing and uh, building purely serverless peer-to-peer -peer web applications. I have some big plans. I'm serious about this one. Do you want to contribute? We've already got hundreds of con contributors from six continents. Uh, there are ways you can help. You can join our Slack and hang out. You can report bugs. You can fix bugs. You can pull requests, triage. And mostly, I just want you to build cool stuff. Um, do you need awesome scalable serverless apps? You should hire me because I'm unemployed. Um, uh, that's my email. Th that's my GitHub that has uh, the source for Zappa and Fashion and the, the talk that you just saw. Thank you very much. And more importantly, thank you to the awesome event organizers and volunteers who put in so much work to make this event happen today. These guys down here. Uh, do you have questions? If not, let's get some beers. Okay, thank you.